Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to MOS at Home. Uh, my name is Karen. I'm one of the many educators that works at the Museum of Science in Boston, and we are super excited for you to be here virtually with us through the screen today to learn a little bit more about animals. So what we've done is we've taken a bunch of questions that we've gotten from our visitors at the museum or viewers of some of our virtual programming, pulled together all these questions, and I have some fabulous scientists with me today to help explain and answer some of those questions. So real quick, I'll let them introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Sue. I am also one of the many educators here at the Museum of Science. My pronouns are she and her, and I will give you a little sneak preview is that my favorite animal is almost always a bird. My name is Mike. My pronouns are he and his, and I handle a number of different kinds of animals at the museum and also take them on the road to schools and libraries for little trips outside the museum. Like a fun field trip for our live animals also it gives them a little extra enrichment. Um, so we all love live animals and love talking about them. So we're going to jump right in and we should be with you today for about 25 or 30 minutes, but you can pause. You can leave and come back at any point in time since we're here in the virtual realm. So let's jump right in and get started. So we always get questions about what is the biggest, the smallest, the fastest, the slowest. So I think a great question that came in from Linda, who is five years old, wants to know how long is the longest snake ever? That is a fantastic question. And the answer is the Titana boa, which has an amazing name, sort of Titan and then boa. You've probably heard of boa constrictors. So this is an ancient snake that lived about 58 to 60 million years ago or so in what is now Colombia. And this snake was about 13 meters long. That's about 40 feet. So we're talking as long as a school bus, which is pretty impressive. And it compares um, quite uh, nicely when you think about the largest snakes around today. Um, the largest still alive is the reticulated python that can grow to be about eight to nine uh, meters long. And um, you may have heard of anacondas as well. They're pretty close to seven to eight meters. Um, so this snake at you know, 40 feet completely dwarfs you know, the 25 to 26 foot long snakes that you can find uh, on the planet today. All right, we've got another great question. And this one comes from Zachary, age seven. Are there any birds that don't lay eggs? I'm glad to answer that question, Zachary. And on the off chance you're asking me a trick question, I will say, yes, all the male birds do not lay eggs. However, if we're talking about female birds, any bird that's ever come into the world had to come in an egg. So let me see, uh, uh, thinking about eggs, uh, there is a question that we've gotten previously from KG age nine about why is the platypus considered to be a mammal since it lays eggs? That is an often asked question and often confused. So the platypus is a mammal that lives in Australia and it is one of the two egg laying mammals extant living here on the planet Earth today. It is still considered a mammal for a couple of important reasons. Um, mammals are covered with fur or hair, much like you and I. We are mammals, we are covered with hair. Uh, cats, dogs, guinea pigs, they're all covered with fur. Little platypuses also are covered with fur. Secondly, they are still considered mammals because they feed their babies milk. So the word mammal actually comes from the mammary glands. That is what produces the milk, the mother's milk for the baby. So female ductal platypuses, they give the baby's milk, they're covered with fur, they're warm blooded or endothermic. So they are considered mammals. They're just kind of unique in that they do still lay eggs, which is pretty awesome if I do say so myself. So I really love these kind of unique uh, and strange things when we're looking at the animal world. So well, we have a question from eight-year-old Evelyn asks, how are bat wings different from bird wings? And bats, of course, are mammals that fly. That's a very cool question. Interesting thing is a lot of 
uh, animals that fly have similar bone structure. So I'm gonna use my hands as an example. Bird wings and bat wings are modified versions of things that look a lot like our hands because at some point all of us had a shared ancestor many millions of years ago. So if you imagine a bat wing is having very long, thin, elongated fingers with a lot of stretchy in between finger material in between those bones, then you can imagine a bat wing, bones with a membrane in between that they used to scoop the air and fly. And they're also mammals, so their bones are really solid bones. Now, birds also have a similar structure, but instead of these elongated versions of fingers that become wings, they actually have bones that have fused and their bones are way lighter and the birds are covered with muscles and embedded in the muscles are feathers that help them fly. So some structural differences, but some, sh some shared um, characteristics that are based on ancient ancestry. So I have a question um, and apparently this question has been asked by many. Um, uh, Clement, age eight, Prisha, age eight, Lily, age seven, and Johanna, age seven, have all asked, how do poison dart frogs get their poison? That's a really interesting question. We actually have poison dart frogs at the museum, and they uh, do not have toxins that they give off, and that's because it comes from their environment. So these um, frogs, and some of them are rather small, think about the size of a paperclip, um, to about this big, you know, maybe uh, the size of a half dollar or so. Those frogs um, eat different animals, they're carnivores, and the animals that they eat um, have been consuming different kinds of plants that have toxins in them. So scientists think that by eating ants and beetles and other insects in uh, the rainforest where they live, they actually sort of take on um, some of those toxins that their body processes in a way. Now these are um, poisonous and not venomous animals. So there's a big difference there. So you'd have to um, eat this animal or lick it or put it in your mouth in order to get those toxins inside you. It's different than a snake or a spider or a bee or a wasp that might inject um, the animal poison into your body. So a little bit different there. The animal world is certainly really, really interesting with lots of cool stuff. Now, while we're talking about amphibians, um, we've also gotten a question about um, the age of amphibians. So what is the oldest amphibian fossil ever found? Yeah, so that's super cool when we're thinking about fossils and paleontology and just all the life that came before us humans. There are millions and millions and millions of years of history of life here on the planet Earth. And the way we as humans today study it is by finding fossil evidence. So when we're thinking about sort of our common modern day frogs and toads and salamanders, they've been around since about the Jurassic period. So we're talking 200 to 140 million years ago. That's how long ago the Jurassic period was. But the oldest ever discovered amphibian fossil comes from even longer ago than that. In fact, almost 368 million years ago. Uh, it was found in present day Scotland, and it is called, I'm probably going to butcher the name, but I'm going to try it, Elginer Pithon. Elginer Pithon? Um, and it was very salamander-like. In fact, the early amphibians um, look and acted a lot like our modern day salamanders do, sort of with that long body and the four legs and the long tail. Um, but that is at least to date, the oldest amphibian fossil that humans have ever discovered, which is pretty cool. Um, there was actually an incredible diverse population of amphibians back in that point in the Earth's history, which is super cool. So thinking about fossils and then moving back to modern day, and I know Sue is our resident bird expert, so I'm hoping she has a good answer for this because this is one of my questions that I've had is, does it hurt a woodpecker when uh, they are actually pecking into a tree? So what happens with their head and their beak? Um, we've gotten this question in a couple of different places during our virtual museum time. This is a great question. I actually had that question as part of a podcast on birds and I'm more than happy to answer it because um, it's fascinating. So woodpeckers are 
are superbly adapted to surviving the high impact of slamming their head repeatedly against a tree in the effort to drill little holes to find insects. Um, their beak is actually very dense for um, the material that bird beaks are typically made out of, which is uh, a thin covering of keratin, which is like what our fingernails are made out of over bone. Most bird bones, I'm sure you've heard, are pretty light, but the bones are very dense in the bird's beak, also in its skull. And when it hammers, a lot of that energy is actually transferred from the beak to the back of the skull where it's very, very thick. And if you ever look at a woodpecker hammering, you notice they'll cling onto the side of a tree and they're pecking away. They have a very short, blunt body and they're actually bracing themselves with their tails. So a lot of the energy from the impact of pecking goes into the bird's body itself and into that braced tail. So basically it distributes all of that energy that normally would cause their brain to slam against their skull into other parts of their body, totally diffusing the effects of all of that uh, energy. Adaptations are amazing, aren't they? Isn't that something? Yeah, it is really cool. So I had a question um, from Faith, age nine. Can some reptiles fly? So that's a really interesting question, kind of relating back to the last one I was talking about. Modern day reptiles that are living on the planet today. As far as I know, there are no true flyers, but in prehistoric times, there were lots of flying reptiles. In fact, um, if you've ever heard of pterosaurs or you know, a good example of that is a pterodon, if you've ever watched Dinosaur Train, which is a fun TV show. If you've never watched it, I recommend it. Um, those were flying reptiles. So they're often mistaken as dinosaurs, but dinosaurs were sort of a separate group. Modern day reptiles, they might not be able to fly, but there are several species that are amazing gliders. So just like we were talking about bats before as mammals that fly, it's the only group of mammals that can fly. But there are things like flying squirrels, if you've ever heard of those guys. Um, they are local here to New England. They do not fly, but they are amazing gliders. So there are some species of snake that are tree snakes. And what they do is when they're trying to move from one tree to another without sort of slithering all the way down the trunk and going across the open ground and going up another tree, they actually launch themselves off of a branch through the air, flatten their body real flat. So they kind of work like a sail or um, an airplane wing. And they glide over to the next tree, land on a branch, and hopefully, you know, get away from their predator maybe, or maybe they're looking for food themselves as snakes are carnivorous. So it is pretty cool that although they do don't fly in modern times, they definitely do have this ability to launch themselves through the sky. And you know, I'm a fan of snakes, but I still don't know that I would want to have a gliding snake hop out of a tree and potentially land on my shoulder. Um, it would be a really fun story to tell though. Hopefully there are no gliding snakes that live here in New England. So if that is something you are concerned about and you live here in uh, the Northeast, we don't have to worry about it. But it is cool that, that is part of the animal kingdom. Maybe safe to watch a video of those gliding snakes. It's pretty amazing to see them sort of move through yeah. video for sure. For sure. They are pretty awesome. Um, so sort of moving away from our snakes and our mammals and our birds, which are all part of the vertebrate group, animals that have backbones. We had uh, a question from a couple different friends, Bronwyn, who is nine, Prisha, eight, and Vivian, also nine wants to know how many invertebrates there are in the world. Just a big question, I think. That's a great question. So when we talk about vertebrates, those are animals with backbones, as Karen said. So you can feel along your own back and feel those bones that run through. And um, humans and all other mammals are vertebrates, but most of the species on Earth today are invertebrates, animals without backbones. So scientists have identified um, over one and a quarter million different species of animals here on Earth, and certainly there are more to still be discovered. The vast majority of those, 97%, are invertebrates. So that means if you had 100 animals lined up in a row, 97 of those 100 animals would not have backbones. Um, of those invertebrates, the animals without backbones, most of them are insects, um, well over half. So there's tons of, actually, I, I should correct myself, well over half of the living creatures or living plants or living anything on earth 
are insects um, with 22% uh, of all species identified. And that includes, you know, plants and fungi and all sorts of stuff. Over 22% of all of the species that we know of are just beetles. So you'll find lots of invertebrates, lots of insects, uh, many in the ocean too. And that's probably why the numbers are going to increase dramatically as we explore more parts of our planet, um, because there are many, 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 probably millions of different species in our oceans um, that we haven't yet identified. Um, and certainly lots of those uh, do not have backbones. That's a great question. Do you have a favorite invertebrate, Mike? Do you have a favorite invertebrate? I, Probably not going to be most people's favorite, but I love Madagascar hissing cockroaches. We have some at the museum and they are wonderful um, for teaching. I also really love um, walking sticks. We also have those at the museum um, and they really do look like sticks. It's a great uh, method of camouflage for them. So they blend into their environment so that predators don't eat them, but they're amazing um, looking. All right, so we talked about vertebrates and invertebrates. I want to go back to birds again, and actually those bird beaks, um, because uh, Clement, age nine, had a question about why do birds have beaks at all and not teeth like other animals? I think that's a fascinating question. Um, most animals, you know, they have a, a mouth for feeding. So any adaptation they have to their environment has to do with them being able to feed. But of course, any adaptation that a bird has uh, generally has to relate to flying unless you're a flightless bird. So first of all, uh, since it is a feeding mechanism, uh, beaks have evolved all different kinds of sh shapes and sizes depending on what birds eat. Um, but the main reason for having a beak rather than teeth because you obviously could consume some food with teeth if you had those, is that birds are designed for being as light as possible. So beaks tend to be a lot lighter than teeth. All of your teeth weigh a lot. Um, bird bones are light and the beak material, which as I said, is a very thin layer of uh, keratin over bone is over this very porous bone that is also very light. So everything about birds is designed for being able to make them as light as possible so they can stay airborne. Cool, and I think we have time for several more questions. So we, we were thinking we might have to wrap up after these few questions, but um, maybe I'll jump in here in the middle and ask, uh, well, let's see. This one's kind of interesting that can birds be affected by the coronavirus, Sue? That is a very interesting question. And to the best of our knowledge right now is that they cannot be impacted by coronavirus. There isn't any evidence that they can uh, catch it from people and that we can catch it from them. That being said, you know, since many people have birds as pets, maybe you're handling a bird in your home and someone else in your home is also handling them, it's good to practice good hygiene. So if anybody's carrying any germs, including COVID, they don't put it on the bird and then the next person that interacts with your bird picks it up. And that might be true for any pet. And I was gonna say, that's something we've been doing at the Museum of Science with all of our live animal collection. We were very careful um, to wear our masks around our live animals and make sure that we're washing our hands even more frequently than we used to, just to make sure we're keeping ourselves, our colleagues and all of our live animals safe as well. Let's see, uh, I think another great question that we get often and is really confusing. So in this case, Visme, who is 13, asked the question of how have animals evolved to have the ability to regenerate limbs? So maybe even starting with what does it mean to regenerate? That's a great question and you know, showcases some of the amazing abilities in the animal world. So this idea of regenerator and growing back a limb or a body part that, um, that has been lost for some reason. And uh, different organisms have uh, varying abilities to do this at different stages of their life cycle. Um, some types of flatworms, for example, planaria, they can actually regrow their whole bodies from just a small piece of tissue, but they're a relatively um, small, simple animal in terms of thinking about the cells or what makes up the animal. Structure. So when we're dealing with animals like mammals and reptiles, um, you don't see that kind of regeneration, um, but you can see regeneration of specific things. 
So for example, there are many different kinds of lizards that can regrow their tails. Um, and that's an adaptation to help for survival. Uh, one of the lizards that we have at the museum is a legless lizard, a European glass lizard. And what they'll do is if a predator is grabbing onto them um, by their tail, they'll drop or lose their tail. The tail kind of keeps moving. The predator gobbles that down while the animal can escape. So that's one example. We also have these fabulous animals at the museum called axolotls, and they're a type of salamander. And um, they can uh, regenerate um, multiple body parts, tails, uh, other kinds of limbs, like uh, their arms and their legs. And that's something that um, is amazing to scientists and they're trying to figure out how and why it happens. Now, obviously there's big evolutionary advantages to being able to um, lose body parts and still survive, right? Uh, most animals wouldn't be able to do that. So if you can do that, it certainly helps you. Um, and scientists are trying to figure that out. So one, one idea is that axolotls, when they're very, very young, um, will actually, um, uh, they'll sort of sort of nibble at each other, um, the young uh, offspring that are sort of siblings, and sometimes they'll bite each other's limbs off and they'll just grow back. So that's one idea, um, the sort of sibling rivalry, I guess you'd say, um, for why the, they've evolved that um, ability. But even later when they're um, fully grown, um, they can um, still regrow. So scientists are looking at the genome, sort of the genes, what makes these animals do that, and trying to figure out if that's even um, something that we can exploit in medicine. Can we use those genes, some of which are in humans, but we just don't use them in exa that exact same way. Can we use those to um, help heal ourselves or develop medicines and ther therapies to uh, um, help people who have lost limbs? So fantastic question. I've got uh, more bird questions um, since I love them and uh, many of our visitors do too. So we've got this question from Saria, age nine, Thomas, age seven, Leah and Sanya, ages four and three, Myra, age nine, Brendan and Madison, age 11, and Zachary, age seven. They all wanna know, Sue, what the fastest bird in the world is. So, um... I would say that as of today, the speed record holder is probably the peregrine falcon. It's a beautiful falcon, a little bit larger than an American crow. We do have them right here in the New England area. In fact, there's a nesting pair that for many years has raised babies successfully on the Customs House Tower in Boston. But peregrine falcons using gravity as an assist apparently can tuck their wings and go into a power dive that will get them up to about 200 miles per hour. So they are the speed demons of the bird world. Pretty phenomenal. Um, I'll take a question that we get. Uh, Clement, age eight, has asked, uh, what is the difference between frogs and toads? And that's a question that we get often, especially if we're talking about amphibians, whether it's in the museum, but at schools and libraries, or even here in our virtual uh, museum programming. And I'm gonna say something that might be confusing. Are you ready? All toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. Same thing as all tortoises are turtles, but not all turtles are tortoises. For the non-biologists in the group, all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles <laughs> are squares. So it may seem very confusing, but basically a toad is just a subgroup of a larger group known as frogs. Now there are some things you can look for on frogs and toads um, to tell if it is more generally a frog or more specifically what we might call a toad. And a lot of that has to do with where you find them. Um, so frogs more generally spend even their adult life in and around the water. So you might see Mike's background. Um, he has a type of frog that does in fact spend most of its time in a very damp area, whether it be in the water itself or nearby. Toads tend to have not smooth skin, a little more lumpy bumpy, um, and you tend to find them living in drier areas. So one of the toads that you might find right here uh, in New England in your own backyard is an American toad. They're you know, a couple inches long, kind of a brownish color and their bodies are really, really lumpy. Sometimes they have giant um, sort of bumps right behind their eyeballs. In many of those, the toads are carrying toxins. So they use that part of that bump on their back to actually produce toxins. Maybe not bad enough to really harm a full-grown human, 
it's certainly bad enough to say harm a bird that might want to munch down on them. Sorry, Sue. I know they're your favorites. Um, so yeah, so that's something if you find something uh, that you think is a frog or a toad, those are a couple of things you can look for. I will also just mention um, amphibians have nothing covering their skin. So they don't have feathers, they don't have fur. Um, their skin is actually very vulnerable to things like the oils in our hands or the dirts or the lotions. So if you do find a frog or a toad out there in the wild, I recommend you use your eyeballs to see what it's doing and make some really great observations don't try to pick it up only because we can do harm to those guys. All right, so I think we might have time for one more question. And I don't think we've gotten to this one yet. And Sue, we're going to end with birds. Why do birds lay eggs? Why do birds lay eggs? Well, remember that I um, mentioned that just about everything that is an adaptation birds would have is to do with flight. Um, and also there's a little shared ancestry. Those of you who like birds a lot probably know that birds and reptiles had a shared common ancestor many, many moons ago. And that in fact, birds are considered to have evolved from one branch of dinosaurs. So of course, anything that was reptile-like did lay eggs. So they had that history there anyway. Uh, their eggs are very, very different from reptile eggs. But if you think about it, everything is designed for flight, for being as light as possible. So being a pregnant bird carrying a baby around trying to fly, <laughs> that's pretty tricky. So a nice way to deal with that is to lay a nice egg that's covered with a hard coating, unlike a lot of the reptile eggs, very well protected. Uh, put it in a nest, get all of that weight out of your body, and you still can fly pretty easily. Great adaptation. Ooh, and one last thing that I just thought of. Um, what bird has the largest egg to body ratio? Uh, I believe one? it is the kiwi. I That's think it's almost a, is it almost a third of their body weight? It's it is, phenomenally it large. And that's insane. probably only because the Kiwi does not fly. <laughs> right. So anyway, that's just a fun, I think a fun note to end on. So Sue, remind you of any last thoughts about animals we've talked about before we kind of wrap up our program today? Nope, just on keep on enjoying them. The ones right outside your window and the ones that live far away, they're all fascinating. You can join us at the museum. Come and see our buried animal collection. We've got lots of different kinds of animals, some that we mentioned and some we didn't, like cotton top tamarind monkeys and amazing tortoises and snakes of various kinds and insects through our uh, insect garden. It's uh, pretty amazing. Excellent. Well, I want to thank all of the awesome scientists here on video with us, Sue and Mike as well as myself. But I also want to thank all of the scientists that are out there watching. And as Sue pointed out, it's amazing just to look out your window, even if you can't get outside, and look at your animals in the backyard and try to think about what makes them so perfectly suited for living in your backyard. So I hope you enjoyed learning all about animals today. And certainly check back. We're going to have a lot of these fun Ask a Scientist videos. Um, you can also look for our live streams and ask those questions live of our educators. So definitely keep an eye out for um, that information on the Museum of, Museum of Science website. So with that said, I wanna thank you guys. Have a great rest, rest of your day. So long. <laughs>